Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. I'm Mike B, and today we're going to be going over the differences between the M16A1 and the M16A2, or in this case, they're both AR-15s because they're semi-automatic. But I'll be giving you the brief history of both weapons, and then we'll go in from stock to uh, muzzle. The differences, um, these are going to be the basic differences. These aren't going to be like the metallurgy, the exact measurements of parts that are different or whatnot. This is just going to be kind of what changed uh, internals, externals, all that stuff. So it might be a little bit of a lengthy video, but we'll try to get it covered and I'll try to not miss anything, which is going to be the real challenge. So basically, in 1983, the M16A1, that's on the top if you don't know what the M16A1 is, had been the U.S. military's primary service rifle for about 15 years. Uh, it was officially adopted in 1968. It was an improvement over the XM16E1 and the M M16. I made another video on that. I'll throw the link to that in the description if you're curious about that. But this is just kind of the next generation, um, kind of the sequel to that video. And there was some things that uh, soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen were kind of wanting on a rifle. And so they decided that they liked the platform, the uh, AR-15's platform, but that they needed to upgrade some things to make it a little bit more user-friendly and adapt to the um, changing environment of warfare at that point. Uh, again, towards the end of the Cold War, things are kind of advancing from the old world into the new. Vietnam was kind of the catalyst for that, the uh, you know World War II kind of stuff, and then now you're more looking at guerrilla tactics and terrorism and stuff. Um, so the weapon needed to adapt to that and become a little bit better. I don't want to say better, just different. Um, <clears throat> so what they did is, the first thing that you'll notice, <clears throat> it's not an optical illusion at all, is the barrels are lined up. Um, that's a little bit of an optical illusion, I guess. Yeah. But they are, they are lined up perfectly straight. The receivers are lined up perfectly straight. And you'll notice already that the uh, M16A2's buttstock is a little bit longer than the M16A1. Now that was because people were complaining that the length of pull was too was too little and they needed a little bit more um, stock basically on their rifle because especially with guys my size it's like yeah the M16A1 stock is really short it's not as, it's a little I think it's about the same size as an AK I don't quote me on that but it feels like it because you have to really pull this up well, the good thing about that is if you like to put your nose on the charging handle like I do to you know maintain a a consistent sight picture, the A1's a little bit better. However, if you want to be more comfortable when you're shooting in general and have a little bit more space to play with on a stock, the A2 is where it's at, and that's what the um, the A2 did. They, I think it's uh, added like an inch or three quarters of an inch. That's the exact measurement stuff that I don't know. Um, but they did add stuff. And uh, also, the M16A2 was kind of the Marine Corps' um, love child. It, it, they're, they're, it was their, their baby, basically. They, they had the most input, so um, other branches did as well, but the Marine Corps is the one that pretty much designed this, and that's what we got out of it. So <clears throat> just figured I'd mention that before I forgot. So just looking at the length, I, don't, I won't have these lined up like this perfectly for the whole video. I just wanted to show you that it's drastically longer. It feels longer. Uh, if you've ever handled either one of these, you'll, you'll notice the difference, but they extended the length. Now, I'm going to pick these up now, and I'll have the A2 on the right and the A1 on the left. So you can see that the buttstock became fully checkered at this point. On the A1, the, the floor plate, which was, this one's actually steel, a lot of them are plastic, was, was the only thing that was checkered. And on the A2, they went with a fully checkered um, butt plate and also a plastic uh, trap door, which is very odd. It actually works, though. Uh, both had the cleaning kit compartment. They look exactly the same, so I'm not going to bust them open. They both got the rear sling swivel held together with that flathead screw. Other than that, they're essentially the same design. The A A2 is also, you know, wider, you can see. Or a little bit, you know, up and down, a little longer. God, I can't get the right angle on this. Um, just a little bit, not too terribly noticeable. But yeah, and then also the, the A2 stock was not fiberglass. This is fiberglass. That's why it's kind of weird like that. It was just a... A, a heavy molded plastic um, polymer or whatever and that's another detail that I don't know somebody somebody will know exactly what kind of plastic it was made out of but it was it was upgraded from fiberglass to that polymer so with that the receiver itself the lower receiver and the upper receiver didn't change size so what ended up happening is inside the, the buttstock here is the buffer tube and everything that's basically the same same thing as well there is a spacer that sits down at the end right here by the uh, butt plate screw 
that actually gives it the extra length to line up perfectly with the um, stock or the I'm sorry the receiver and actually give you that extra little inch and it's like I think it's like three quarters of an inch half inch to three quarters of an inch that spacer is and it's just a little disc a little round disc that went in there and um, the tube the buffer tube itself is a little bit different to account for that extra space but that was really cool with the butt stock I actually like that feature to each their own but um, I, I really <laughs> appreciate a little longer length of pull so we'll move on a little bit you can see right away that uh, I guess what, what's the first thing we got to encounter okay the forward assist here's a big thing that changed between the a1 and the a2 you can see the old school teardrop on the a1 right and right here you've got just the standard push button which is pretty consistently um, standard and from 1983 until nowadays even on the m4 a lot of similarities between the uh, m16 a2 and the m4 so basically this is about the technology we've got now. It's just a shorter weapon with different aesthetic things. Um, but yeah, you, a lot of this is true for the M4 as well. So that's why I don't have one of those in the video. I just figured I'd keep it more simple. Anyway, so teardrop forward assist on the A1 and the M16A2 was um, the, just the push button because, or the round button, because they figured out that the teardrop would get caught on stuff and it becomes very annoying. And as little of a problem as that may seem, it, things like that actually can suck really bad getting caught on things you can lose gear so it's just a little improvement or whatever I, I personally like the teardrop better I feel like I can get more um, torque with it when I hit it because there's more area hitting your palm but again it brings me back to the whole thing why the hell do you need a forward assist on a platform if it's so perfect anyway um, this works just as well as that I've used both and um, they're pretty identical it's just the shape of the actual little handle on there Charging handles are basically identical. Now, here's a little detail that you uh, that I kind of screwed up on one of my videos a long time ago on before I actually realized this, is, let's try to bring them up here again. Well, I'll point to it first and then I'll actually show you because I'm only I'm not an octopus, I only have two arms. On the receiver itself, the lower receiver, the firearm, um, you'll notice on the A1, the little, the little channel right there for the detent and um, takedown screw spring there we go got that all out is widely visible and there's not a lot of reinforcement well what happened is apparently on a lot of the previous models like the a1 and the the xm16 e1 and all that stuff is this area right here would crack it would develop a crack from god knows what the recoil whatever so they decided on the a2 to actually bring the reinforcement which they had on the a1 a little bit down farther and you can barely see this channel on there so I will, I'll show you that, see? So it's actually a really small detail, but um, I wasn't even aware of it until recently, or not, about a year ago. And that's a great way to tell an A1 receiver from an A2 or a modern receiver, basically. So that's that. Um, all right, let's get down to the pistol grip. So the pistol grip itself, is relatively the same shape, same angle and all that stuff, uh, attaches the same. However, on the A1, you don't have, it's a smooth grip, and then apparently this used to be for a compartment that was spring-loaded or something to put stuff in there. Most of these, you're going to find, don't have that on there anymore. And the A2 just simply doesn't have the little little things to put that, that little latch on because they figured out it was a pretty pointless accessory and a pretty pointless thing to put on a weapon. And then they added a finger groove right here. It's a single finger groove, and some people hate this, and some people love it. Uh, same with that grip. Some people hate it, some people love it. I don't mind either. I'm very familiar with this one because it's the same thing that's on an M4 today, and you just get used to it. This does, if you're not wearing gloves, this can get really annoying, especially if you get like wet or something, uh, rubbing against your fingers if you're carrying it all day. But generally speaking, it, it's it's not bad. Um, to me, it really doesn't make that much of a difference for either grip. They both work. They're both at the same angle. Look at the check ring right there. So that's that. That's all I got to say about that. Now we get to a really fun part is the rear sight itself slash carry handle. So you'll notice on the A1, it's, uh, they're both, I'm sorry, they're both non-detachable carry handles. That's another thing that's similar, okay? But on the A1, you're going to have this basically really rudimentary windage adjustment right here and you're not going to have anything for elevation it's all done with the uh, front sight post which is still true on the m16a2 and modern weapons however 
It's a lot easier to adjust your windage during a firefight or during combat or whatever you want to say or to hit a long range target from back here. And this is also a pain in the ass because you have to use a bullet or a, a small like screwdriver or some kind of like uh, nail or something. I don't know. To actually move this, you got to push in that little detent and move it. Uh, usually just the uh, bullets were used, but um, and it only it's only adjustable for windage. It's also a pretty weak area because it's not that thick. Um, you do have a little hole right there for accessories. But yeah, that's essentially the rear sight. You've got an aperture, dual aperture, which is the same on the A2. But um, the if you see this, that's the battle sight basically, right? And that is the 300 sight. I'm pretty sure. Let me see really quick. Yep. So the battle sight on here, the aperture is actually pretty small, um, considering. And this 300 meter uh, rear sight is about the same size as on an A2, and I'll show you that in a second. So you've seen this. You see the rear, the rear mechanism of the rear sight on the A1. Now the A2 is actually pretty sweet. So here's your, we'll start with the aperture first because that's pretty fresh in your mind. There's the, the battle sight now for zero to 200 meters. It's also marked, it's not just L. So it's, a, it's substantially bigger and it actually, it, uh, it, it's really easy to acquire your target a lot faster than having to look through a smaller aperture. And then you get the 300, which is, or your three to eight actually, which is just, sorry, hit the thing. Which is just as small as the one on the A1, but the battle sight changed a little bit. Now. You'll see right away that this is a separate piece. So when you don't have that on there, this receiver looks really weird. It looks like it's got a big part cut out of it. And this is adjustable for windage right here, okay? And elevation, which I gotta flip this around. So this A2, this is origi an original A2 upper, by the way. So that's why everything else is, is um, aftermarket. It's mil spec, but you know, it's exactly what an M16 A2 would look like. But this is the only actual original part on this on this rifle because A2 parts get to really hard to find. So um, anyway, so it's got the 8.3, which means 800 meters and 300 meters. When it's on three and this this rear sight is all the way down here like that, you're you're set to 300 meters, and that's where you usually zero. That's where the Army qualifies at. The Marine Corps does five, but you're still gonna want to zero at three um, for adjustment for when you're shooting at five. So you rotate it this way, and we're at four. Now we're at five. There's that little line right there that lines up. Six, seven, and then you come all the way full circle to 800 meter or 800 yards, and you can see that the sight actually raises up. So that's a substantial improvement over the A1 that was basically a fixed rear sight that you had the option to adjust windage on, but not elevation. So this made it a lot easier to actually adjust for distance when you were um, qualifying and stuff, or if you were actually at a long distance firefight. So. That was another major improvement, I think, personally. Um, and it's just a little bit more beefy of a, of a upper receiver. You don't have this little area right here that actually is prone to cracking. So that's a pretty, pretty cool feature. Um, we'll move forward just a little bit. And if you can see this, I have to make sure I keep these in the frame. Sorry, guys, this is an awkward angle. This is all I've got to work with for space. You'll see that... The A1 doesn't even have a shell deflector on it. Now, I know there was the the one, the C7, basically, that was an A1 with a shell deflector that was kind of a transitional or slash experimental thing and then Canada bought them, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just talking about these main differences in these main rifles from basically, the, the, they officially went to the, from the A1 to the A2, so I'm not going to be talking about all the little models in between and the, you know, the A1s that had heavy barrels and stuff. Ooh, getting ahead of myself. But this is just the basic difference between these basic rifles, so I'm not going to get into the complicated stuff. No shell deflector, shell deflector added. Actually does make a difference. It really does. It deflects it forward and, and uh, out of the way most of the time so you don't get as much hot brass down your shirt. And then we'll move down and we'll actually go to the fire control kit. So obviously both of these are semi-automatic. They're not class three at all. These are just, this is an Anderson lower. This is a, um, a, a Brownells lower. The actual difference the main difference in these weapons is the fact that the m16a1 was select fire to fully automatic in the third position you know click 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 is fully automatic and then the marine corps and in their infinite wisdom decided that fully automatic wasted too many too many rounds and it was really uncontrollable so on the a2 you've got a three round burst option in place of the fully automatic that is a massive difference okay and that is the biggest difference i think 
that people don't really understand. They think that this is fully automatic. The M16A3 was fully automatic, but that was only issued to very, very specialized units. Um, and it, there's not a lot of them floating around. The A1, fully automatic when it's on its third selector's position. M16A2, three-shot burst. That's true on the M4 as well. Uh, the M4A1 is the fully automatic, but the M4 standard issue carbine for U.S. forces is three-round burst on your third selector position. Obviously, I don't have, you know, I can't move it to that because these are semi-automatic receivers, but you get the picture. So that that that's the biggest difference and the most important one to be able to tell, um, I guess. I, I The rest of them are all just little aesthetic details and minor improvements. Um, I don't think the three-round burst is an improvement. I think it's stupid. I, it's pointless. You might as well just have full auto because most of the time if you're going to be using three-round burst, you're going to be firing it, you know, pop, 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 so it's just full auto like we did. Um, but most of the time, 99% of the time, you're going to have your, your M16 or M4 on semi-automatic. So I don't understand what the hell the point of that was, but who am I? All right, so you notice the fencing is all the same, right? It's the, got the protection. The mag release button is the same. Basically all this area is identical. Don't need fixing, don't change it. Now, we get up to here, this is a small detail, right? The uh, slip ring, this one is tapered and the, all the modern ones are tapered forward, right? And you can see the M16A1 was the last kind of weapon to have the straight non-tapered slip ring. So that's where another difference lies. Now, we'll get to the handguards and then we'll talk about the barrel. So the handguards went from the triangular, I call them the sturgeon, the sturgeon handguards because they are shaped like a sturgeon fish, like if you've ever seen one, the triangle. They're pretty comfy. I like them. I don't really have a problem with them like a lot of people do. They went from the triangular handguards to the uh, basically the XM177 or the CAR15 Hangars, they just made them longer. Um, not really much else to say about that. I think those were fiberglass as well. These are polymer. They both have the heat shield, the aluminum heat shields inside. Um, these ones go on, the, the, the uh, A2 ones go on top and bottom, and those go on side to side. There's a right and a left, and this is a top and bottom. So there's that difference. Now, when we get to the barrel. The barrel is another really important difference that if you're ever going to be building one of these or you get an original parts kit for either one of these, or actually just the A1 you need to be concerned about, is the barrels did change, okay? So you can see, I'll actually bring it right up to the camera. You can see that uh, the A2 is on the right and the A1 is on the left. Now this is an aftermarket barrel on the A1. It's a modern one, and I got it for a reason, because the original barrels were a 1 in 12 twist rate, and they were a lightweight barrel, right? You can see the one on the right, the A2, is a 1 in 7 twist, and it's a lot heavier. It's a lot thicker. I don't have calipers to show you how thick it is, but definitely a lot thicker. And I, I know this says 1 in 8. It's, again, an aftermarket barrel. I don't have the original barrel on here. But the original barrels were 1 in 12, and a lot of the reproduction kits from Brennan Isles are going to have a 1 in 12 twist. Now what that means is that that rifle, the A1, was designed to shoot the M193 55 grain full metal jacket cartridge and because of that low or that you know gradual twist rate and a lighter weight bullet it allowed it to stabilize. Lighter weight bullets like more gradual twist rates and heavier bullets require a, a shorter twist rate to stabilize. So that's why they went with the 1 in 7 twist on the M16A2 and they came out with the M855 ammunition which is a 62 grain and it's got the armor or the whatever you call it the armor penetrating tip or whatever in it but it's a 62 grain bullet projectile and it's allowed to stabilize in 1 in 7. Now you can run 55 grain through the 1 in 7. You cannot run uh, 62 grain through that. It will keyhole. You'll not be able to hit anything at 25 yards. Ask me how I know. I just went out and tested it to see how bad it really was, and it's terrible. So they're not interchangeable. The good thing about the one in seven or you know up to a one in nine twist, you can run any any weight bullet through it, any kind of ammo, which is really cool. And that's the reason that I opted for that upper to have a one in eight twist, so I can run anything through it. I do have a couple of the other ones that I got a one in twelve twist on, which it is what it is. Now another little difference you'll see in the front sights, if you didn't already catch it, is the actual front sight post. So on the A1, it's a round front sight post. 
if you can kind of see that. And on the A2 and Modern Weapons, it's a square front sight post. Now the front sight base itself looks very similar. Um, you got the little pin right there. The A2 looks a little bit beefier, but uh, essentially they're the they're pretty they're pretty similar. They have the bayonet lug right there. They take the same bayonet and all that stuff. But you'll notice that yeah, the I think the A2s it looks a little bit beefier because it has to be to fit around the the heavy barrel or heavier barrel. So, but essentially the same shape, same concept. That's where your gas comes out and cycles the uh, action and all that stuff. So, all right, we're almost done here, people. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, now, we're going to go to the muzzle devices. So, the A1 birdcage, right, has got little holes all around it. And the A2, they figured out that if you just, if you didn't um, port the bottom or put holes in the bottom, and you just had the gas coming out of the top, and you had a little bit more, or a little bit less space in between them. Sorry, let me line these up. Oh, this one's upside down. That's why it's hard. If you put the put the slits closer together and you just put them on the top, that it'll actually cycle, or uh, not cycle, push the muzzle down when you fire instead of just kind of being a flash hider. So that's another little improvement to the M16A2, and it actually does reduce recoil along with the heavier barrel. So those are all the main and important, I guess, differences between these two rifles. Uh, both have their pros and cons. Like if you're going to go full auto, you might as well have an A1, but for all around purposes, I mean, these the A2 is still being used. And the reason the parts kits are really hard to find on the US market is because we sold most of them to allied countries or who we think are allies, but that's besides the point. Um, a lot of other countries, the Afghan National Army uses these. Uh, everybody uses these. The Air Force definitely uses these now. Um, still, in a lot of police departments, these are a really popular platform. It's that the 20 inch. Uh, the Marine Corps essentially uses the same platform. It's just the A4, so the carry handle's removable, and it's got the Picatinny rail heat shields. But essentially, it's the same rifle itself, just a couple little aesthetic differences. So this platform is still being used. The A1 has been phased out for some time now, after Desert Storm and pretty much the late 90s, and you're probably not going to see an A1 um, in the Iraq-Afghanistan conflict. I mean, there's always an exception, but... That's been pretty much essentially phased out. They're all collectible. We sold them off to a ton of different countries. Kind of weird how we do that, right? Why don't you just sell them to U.S. customers? Keep them in the, keep them in the country. But anyway, there. So that's the main differences. Again, this is a, for reference, everything is, everything except the barrel and the lower receiver on here is an original Colt A1 parts kit. Um, and, well, and the fire control group. I don't have the full auto stuff in there. Obviously, you can see the third pins, not neither one of those. So I guess, I guess, yeah, the fire control group's not original on that. So screw me. And then the only thing that's original on this A2, because they're so damn hard to find, and A1s are hard to find forever too, is the upper receiver itself. Um, the bolt carrier, charging handle, that's all mil spec, new made, as well as all that stuff. So, but yeah, the barrels, barrel, this is a Capco upper. For those of you that are wondering, it's not a Colt, it's a Capco. They made these in the late 90s to... Uh, upgrade the Air Force and the Coast Guard's A1s to A2s. And they basically, you had a lot of uh, A1 lowers with A2 uppers, which I guess is fine. That'd be a pretty cool combo. But yeah, anyway, all right, I'll stop rambling because this video is going on quite a bit. I just kind of wanted to make this video recently, just finally put this one together. So now, you know, I'm getting the U.S. firearms from 1903 all the way till today. I just got to get an M14 or, you know, obviously a clone and a, uh, an M4. And then I'll have every single American service rifle, main service rifle from 1903. So that's the goal. Um, can't wait to go to the range and shoot this. I know how it's gonna shoot. They're, they're really good shooters and they're fun. And yeah, so, but it's snowing right now, so I won't be able to make videos. Anyway, all right, I'll, I'm done rambling. I promise, I promise, I promise. If you made it this far, thank you so much. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you uh, give it a thumbs up because that actually matters in the algorithmic promotion of it. Um, leave a comment if you got any questions. Hopefully this answered all of them. If I forgot something, don't be a dick about it. Like I'm only human and I'm doing this on the fly and not really, uh, scripted on my channel if you haven't noticed. Um, but anyway, so yeah, if I forgot something, let me know. I think that's all the basic differences and whatnot. And if you'd also consider becoming a supporter on Patreon to help fund cool videos like this, I used some of my Patreon money to actually get this original upper, which is really hard to find. And I'm going to be making some really cool videos with it. 
in the coming future. So the link to that is in the description. It's a dollar a month, 12 bucks a year buys you in. That's like two or three cups of coffee, depending on where you live, maybe one cup in some places, but it really helps the channel keep growing as I can't afford to fund it completely out of pocket anymore. If not, I totally get it. I appreciate you watching and we'll see you on the next video.